We are back. Ask the doc in Santa Monica. Hey, doc. Hey. <laughs> good to see you, my friend. It's good Good to be back on the air again with you here, man. No lunch today. We came on a different day. <laughs> I know, Next time. man. It's been brutal. If, yeah. <laughs> I, I, although I'm trying to, to, to get up a, a hill in France, so... If I miss a meal, it's probably good for me right now. Oh, yeah, okay. I told you that, right? We can talk about it. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Okay. All right. You got some good questions? Yeah. The first one says, uh, very simply, can pre pregnenolone cause varicose veins? Uh, interesting question because I have no idea physiologically how it would. Uh, pregnenolone is simply the sort of the first category off of cholesterol and that cascade of hormones, the steroid hormones. Um, you know, generally categorized as pregnenolone, uh, DHEA, progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. Why it would cause a varicose vein, I can't even begin to try and explain physiologically. Um, so it's kind of a tough one to, to, to say anything about, except no. That's why <laughs> they're that asking, I guess, because yeah, you know, no, people I mean, have the wrong information. So. The, um, you know, conversion to maybe, uh, gosh, even, um, you know, if it goes over to the corticosteroids rather than the, uh, you know, we call the, the sex uh, steroids, the sex hormones, you know, it's only going to help, <clears throat> you know, keep inflammation down or, uh, you know, uh, guard the, the vessels, I guess to say, even progesterone. I don't know. I'm, I'm totally riffing here. I, I have no idea why it might cause varicose veins, which are simply typically a result of, you know, the valve gets blown out in the, in the, it's, it should be a one way valve so mm. that the blood goes, you know, in, in a circulatory fashion, uh, from the, well, everyone knows about the circulation, but, um, mm. so that it doesn't back up. It's got a one way uh, valve in the veins heading back to the heart. And if those, valves break down then you can have a backup and the veins start to get uh, engorged with blood mm. and they get they grow larger and larger and they start to get uh, tortuous yeah. and, and they you know we call them varicose veins yeah. um, they typically typically aren't a problem uh, but we can remove them a good vascular surgeon will simply you know sort of splice or or sometimes it's just a you know sort of a side uh, channel and we don't necessarily need it and the main flow or other flows are sufficient, so we cut it out. Sometimes they can be um, more than simply unsightly, which is the reason why people get them removed. Sometimes mm -hmm. they can be painful, but that's that's not usually the case. So, again, I'm rambling okay. here because I don't have a good answer except no, for no, okay. I, I don't know why pregnant will cause varicose veins. Just at least Sorry. people know now. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Doc. All right. Next question says, uh, truly a lot of knowledge here. I wish more people could hear him say that the fastest way to restart your test after Anavar or whatever is to simply do nothing at all. Just come off the VAR, Anavar, and your testes will get the signal to restart. And fast, right, Doc? This is funny, that because I just had a patient, I wonder if it's the same person, uh, this week, I want to say yesterday, or over the weekend, sorry, uh, ask me about this. And it's something I apparently said before. Have I talked about this before? Anyway, you mentioned it. Yeah, I mean, let me let me make it all clear, uh, just so that people don't think this is the greatest, best way to do this. Certainly, if you are, if you stop taking testosterone or any other form of an androgen that would, you know, stop your endogenous production, uh, whether it's you know Anavar or something else. Um, your body is made to pick up on the lack of testosterone and uh, accommodate in correct course by the pituitary sending a signal to the testicles to get producing again. So when I say it's the fastest way, it's not necessarily the fastest way because certainly we have ways to smooth that transition before if you have some warning, in other words, and you say, oh, okay, I want to come off, I don't know, March 1st, then here it is, February 8th, we'll say, okay, well, let's put you on HCG in a dose sufficient to get your testicles working again. I refer to them as diesel engines. They're mm -hmm. harder to get started than the pituitary I refer to as a gas engine, which as soon as the levels drop, will send a signal. But the, you know, the, the, the testicles might take a while to respond to that signal, okay? If we use HCG 
before we jump off of TRT or Anavar in this case, he's asking, then presumably we get those diesel engines started so that when they do get the signal, they're ready and we'll smooth that transition. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessary, and certainly the idea of what people call post-cycle therapy, meaning waiting until you come off to mm -hmm. then use the ACG, to me, I, I, maybe that's what this question refers yeah. to, um, then yeah, I mean, your pituitary will step up to the plate. It's and, more dramatic. And send the signal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. luteinizing hormone, which is, you know, ACG is a homologue of that. There's LHCG receptors floating around. Um, I guess you could argue that if you used enough HCG, you could maybe get the testicles to run faster than just, you know, the natural production from the pituitary. But, you know, at some point, there's, you know, only so many receptors in the, yeah. and, 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 you know, you're just overdoing it. So, yeah, um, one of the fastest ways to get your testicles up and running in is just um, letting the pituitary do its job. But there's a very big difference there, and I, this is the point I want to get across, and maybe this is what uh, I'm assuming this is a gentleman is, is, is asking me about, um, post psychotherapy, in other words, waiting until you pull off of whatever it is you're using, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, you could argue six of one, half of the other with some caveats in that obviously if estrogen is still elevated, we want to do something to lower the estrogen as well so that the luteinizing hormone will be produced by the pituitary. I guess that's a major caveat. But without having the testosterone on board, uh, you know, it's a substrate from which the estrogen is made, well, then it's highly unlikely that would be the case. So, again, uh, a better version of coming off that would make it easier and faster than just going cold turkey or just doing post-cycle therapy would be knowing it's coming yeah. and starting the... the, the um, Preparation. The, what we would call, uh, what, the... Um, well, restarting the testicles, getting getting them, uh, you know, recrudesced, maybe it would be a good word, beforehand. Yeah, like, thanks, Doc. Yeah, so the third question asks, uh, can I take IGF-1 if I have hypothyroidism? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, yeah, why not? Uh, again, I'm, I'm having trouble. This is the second one tonight. I'm not sure where the question is going because... IGF-1 is very different than, uh, say, thyroid hormone. Uh, IGF-1 is made by the liver after being activated by, you know, growth hormone, and we're talking about a, a, uh, a protein-based hormone rather than a, well, actually, sorry, um, they're both protein-based, I beg your pardon, but um, the two, how would they be linked together? Uh, their, their, their production is both uh, initiated, if you will, thyroid and, and IGF-1 by something, a message from the pituitary. Again, um, it's more direct in some senses with the thyroid, although we go through T4 and T3 to finally get to free T3 and we get, you know, a growth hormone before we get to IGF-1. So again, I'm just sort of riffing here um, with Elevations in uh, GH, and maybe I'm 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 missing the question here because maybe this person is referring to actually using exogenous IGF one rather than say exogenous GH or, or natural production of it. Can you still buy that? I mean, can you still? I don't, I don't know if you can. I don't know. I, I don't recommend it. Used it used to be back in the day. I don't know. Uh, I've seen. Yeah, it offered at one point. I'd have to check to see with mm. my pharmacies. I'm sorry, I didn't get prepared enough for that. But mm. apparently, uh, well, the question you know, presumes that you can get a hold of IGF-1, yeah. I guess. Um, but, you know, to me, taking IGF-1 without its precursor growth hormone doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, um, one thing I was talking about earlier today that might um, just shed some knowledge where I'm not apparently doing a good job here with the question, <laughs> except to say, sure, um, is, uh, you know, most people think that people take human growth hormone when it comes to body composition to put on more muscle because the idea of growth, right? Mm -hmm. Growth with growth hormone where it's, you know, what it eventually, um, what eventually gets produced 
because of growth hormone and lasts a lot longer in the system and doesn't get the credit, by the way, but uh, is, you know, growth hormone, the, the growth and growth hormone reflects bone growth more than just about anything else in terms of importance when we were younger. It still helps other things grow, uh, but more than anything for our age group, or let's say, you know, 26 years old and above, it really helps with fat loss. There's a, there's a receptor yeah. for growth hormone on, I believe, every fat cell that we have. And, you know, uh, growth hormone will, will get um, the fat cells to release, you know, fatty acids and, and drop fat is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So most bodybuilders, uh, whether they believe so or not, are, are getting their best effects of, you know, the use of growth hormone by, by leaning out. Mm -hmm. and, and that can happen for us too. So one contraindication, not a contraindication, but one thing you want to be careful of if you're using growth hormone or IGF-1 is the potential for increased blood sugar. Mm. Okay, that's one thing that maybe there's some confusion here. But so, so if you have diabetes, then you might want to make some adjustments, but it wouldn't necessarily be contraindicated. Again, I'm going way off track here from the question. So no, but I'll it's just stop there. Yeah. Can I take IGF-1 if I have hypothyroidism? I would think so, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Doc. You kept it rolling there. I <laughs> Go ahead, Doc. So this one says, uh, I'm 21 years old and I want to do a six-week cycle of Anavar, 50 milligrams, but I'm worried about not bouncing back, also known as not being able to produce my own testosterone. Well, that is a concern to be addressed for sure. And again, I'm speaking generally of a, you know any 21-year-old. As I've said before, it's generally accepted that somewhere around, when I was in school, it was 26, maybe it's 25 now, but uh, up until that point, you haven't fully developed your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis yet. And so um, while we still, well, while we believe it's not hardwired anymore, it's more softwired, it still hasn't been developed yet. And there's the possibility that you would disturb the formation of that axis and that's not a good thing. So there is some risk there um, that you would be, um, again, messing up your system. But I haven't seen that happen and not be able to be fixed yet in my career, if you will. I, it's got to happen, though, and, and, and yeah. you do run a risk. Now, the other thing is when you are disturbing that formation or its its function even, no matter what, and at what point in life, the amount of, well, in this case, let's just stick with um, its formation uh, because that's what our concern is. By the time you're my age, you're not worried about the HPA axis being formed anymore. You're just worried about the function. Um, so the... Potential for damage is a function of the, really more than anything, the chronicity of use. So how long you're on this, not necessarily the dose. And uh, its effect on the function, I go back and say, well, that, that's also a function of age. And that's to do with, you know, coming off of, uh, of testosterone replacement or, or, or um, an anabolic and, and wondering how long it would take to restore your endogenous production. In this case... You know, being on uh, a cycle, he's calling it, for six weeks of Anavar, um, and the dose isn't really that important. But 50 milligrams is a hefty dose. Um, yeah, most likely would not affect you, but I can't say that for sure. Right. But I'm just saying, in keeping with the chronicity of use, uh, in other words, versus, say, being on it for a couple of years, I've seen this before in my practice. You know, no, you wouldn't believe it. Um, even in this country, but in a lot of other countries too, where it's much more easily accessed, accessed, I guess is the way I should say that, um, then, then uh, yeah, people are getting on awfully, awfully early. And not to go too far afield here, but we don't publicize it that much because we'd rather not have unwanted children because of the lack of contraception. But the same issue occurs with females who get on birth control pills, which affects the same axis, okay, mm -hmm. prior to full development of that axis before age 26. You can look it up. We mm -hmm. don't talk about it, but we've seen instances where girls get on birth control for whatever reason at, at 15 and then have troubles later because that development has been, you know, um, 
affected by by the exogenous use of these same types of hormones, all these you know steroid hormones. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, I was going to add something else here. Um, the odds that you'll bounce back if you did it would be pretty good. Um, I can't think of anything else to add here, although, you know. So it was better to keep it shorter, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, I know what I was going to say, though. The problem with that is, um, and in my day, you know, I'm in my 60th year now, guys did six, maybe eight week cycles, and that was a cycle. Yeah. The problem is, as we know now, a lot of times uh, 12, it doesn't sort of weeks. kick in yeah. until six weeks, maybe four weeks in certain instances, but really six weeks. So what are you doing? Uh, so, yeah, what 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 risk benefit or you know yeah. are, do we have here? Something worth considering. Like, why would you want to do this if you're really not getting that much out of it? Yeah. Presumably, either. Yeah. So I just want to throw that in there. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Doc. Ready? Yep. Okay, this one seems like a long one. My story with testosterone started back in 2019 when I was a super depressed and a whopping 145 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, I thought I was going to say pounds. I would start crying out of nowhere. Sex life was non-existent. Would get panic attacks, anxiety. Started TRT at 200 milligrams once every two weeks and was fine for 10 months until insomnia hit me like a truck and didn't sleep for one entire month and was desperate to find a solution. Stopped taking TRT, lost all my gains that I worked so hard to achieve, couldn't take it anymore as I didn't know when my insomnia would go away, started taking, sorry, there's not any punctuation here, or as much, started taking all kinds of pills to sleep over the counter, prescription like Lunesta and Ambien gave the most horrible side effects until one day I finally found a solution all on my own. It was clonazepam. That's a benzodiazepine, very long acting, also goes by the brand Clonopin. Uh, after six months of finally getting some sleep, I decided to get back into TRT as some things were just not there, even though my test was at 365 nanograms per deciliter at that moment, I still felt empty and with a cloudy head went again to an endocrinologist and wasted my time for an entire month as he did not want me to take any TRT and said that was like coffee. Went back to my urologist. I explained the situation to her. She was more than happy to see me feel better and was all in on me to start my treatment again. But this, I had done some extended research. Sorry, missing some words too. Uh, which was to now split my injections into twice a week. And that's what I did now six months later. I'm at 1,200 level, feeling super great. I can still sleep, and I think that was the best choice I ever made. Two times a week on the shoulder with a 27-gauge needle in the morning. Okay. I also take 0 0.3, I don't know, which is 60 milligrams for a total of 120 milligrams weekly. Well, what are your ready. thoughts on this doc? Okay. That was difficult for me. I don't know how we lost a lot of the punctuation, but we did, and I apologize. <laughs> but um, So the issue here, though, is a couple things. I mean, first and foremost, you're feeling better. Let's start there. Right. And I don't see you doing anything that is far-fetched or crazy or harmful, except for one thing. There's a small group of people, roughly 15%, that can get away with using a benzodiazepine without having significant side effects, which usually end up being uh, withdrawal effects, even if you're still taking the medication. So mm. you accommodate to it, and uh, that can lead to you know higher dosing, and then you feel better for a while, then you don't, and you start having withdrawal symptoms again, even though you're still on it. Um, I think, honestly, we're going to hear more about this than we ever heard about opioids and opiates one day. Oh. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, there's a gal, Heather Ashton, who's now passed on, but uh, in the UK, and she had a, a website, benzo.org slash UK, I think. And um, uh, she did a lot of research. Of course, you're going to read the worst cases on the Internet, right? But still... Even some of the not so 
or as bad cases sound pretty bad to me. And I've seen it in my career for sure, um, where um, because the side effects of withdrawal, for example, aren't as obvious as they are with opiates, where you've got a lot of physical symptoms, more of the symptoms are mental with mm. um, uh, benzodiazepine withdrawal. And again, I'm not just talking about stopping cold or trying to wean off. I'm talking about while you're taking it, again, your body gets used to it. It's a so sleep aid. It's a sleep uh, to help People sleep. use it as a sleep aid. It's what we call an anxiolytic. So okay. it's something that reduces uh, the feelings of anxiety and can be very effective. If you've got anxiety and you take one of these, you're like, this is God's answer to anxiety for the time being, okay. you know, briefly. Um, and a lot of people, again, use it for sleep. It's usually not to, to make you or help you fall asleep so much as help you stay asleep. Mm. It's for the type A's or the ruminators out there that, you know, as soon as they uh, can wake up and have enough energy to start worrying again, start worrying again. Mm. So, you know, the first four hours of sleep and they wake up and they go, okay, let's start ruminating. It's, it's, it's very effective for them okay. for the sleep part. And there's back and forth still about how it affects the sleep architecture whether it's uh, negatively or not, used to be they said, yeah, well, you think you're asleep, but it's affecting your your different stages of sleep and, and again, what we call our sleep architecture such that it's really not a good thing even though you think yeah. it is. Anyway, I can go on and on about that. That's not the it's nature good to of the know. question. Yeah. But no. for this, um, oh, well, I will add, too, that the Ambien's and the Lunesta's are not a good idea either. Very addictive. Same type of situation can occur. They're all considered what we call Z drugs, because uh, they have a Z in them, uh, in the generics name, anyway, I mean the generic names. Uh, and I don't recommend them except in case of emergencies, you know, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But the TRT dosing here is very odd, but who cares? As long as it's working for this person, obviously a male, um, it's fine. It's a very small dose, 120 milligrams a week, typically doesn't bring benefit. Um, and certainly even 200 milligrams every two weeks often doesn't bring benefit for the entire two weeks, I'll say. You'll okay. have a, a, a peak in a trough, and during part of that two weeks, oh, this is great, and then you're like, oh, God, and you kind of go on a roller coaster ride. I thought in the end that he was taking one one dosage uh, split half every three days. And I've heard that like more and more recently, people talking about that. They're saying, oh, I they feel like it works better. Do you agree with that, or are you still... I know most people don't like to shoot themselves, you know, so it's a lot easier just to do one injection a week. But let's say the person doesn't care, like some of your patients, would you recommend for them to do it twice a week every three days or does it really matter or no? I don't remember if we brought this up or not, but I, I bring it up very often in my office, certainly with my patients. The problem is, well, first of all, you already brought up, yeah, it's, it's another stick or more, you know, if it's bi-weekly, it's another stick. If yeah. it's every other day, it's, you know, three and a half uh, yeah. sticks a week. So, but does it work better? Most people would like to do it once a week, but is there yeah. better for them to do it less twice a week? In my experience, typically it's no. Okay, that's what I thought. What I see is more often than not, someone will come in and say, "Hey, doc, by the way, I read on Doctor Google, blah 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 blah," and I said, well, "Why you did? Why, why'd you do it?" Well, like I said, it's going to smooth out my titer of testosterone. Okay, but really, why did you do it, though? Well, because it's going to give me a more even level of testosterone. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, okay, but what's that doing for you? And typically, it, in other words, it wasn't because of any way they were feeling not getting resolution of symptoms with the once-a-week injection. And typically, when I ask them, well, do you feel any better? The answer is no. They just think it's better for them because they read it on somebody's website or there's a theory behind it. And the problem is this. I fixed a few of those bad haircuts, and I think I've said this before, about 50% of the time, the wheels fall off the wagon. I had a, a, a very famous trainer who was taking this at a weekly dose, doing great. We, 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 you know, we reversed a lot of low T symptoms, and things were going really well. New life, new career, everything's really smoking really well. And I don't remember his, whatever the source was of his deciding to change, but he did. And he was going, I believe it was every other day. And the wheels fell off the wagon. Meaning all the resolution of symptoms went away. In other words, the low T was back where it was. I mean, 
erectile dysfunction to be specific. Wow. Uh, the workout started suffering. Body composition started suffering. And it wasn't because he changed his diet or anything else we could come up with. Wow. Uh, we got him back on, eventually we got him back on the once a week dosing, which kind of made sense. Hey, what did you change? And we changed that back and everything came back to its, you know, the way it was. wonderful state having, you know, resolved the symptoms. I am only riffing here, guessing who knows why. We don't have any studies that show why it might make a difference, but just one, I mean, if we're going to go bro science, I can, I can give you something that might make sense, that at least physiologically does make some sense. Just like with, for example, uh, IV nutrition, where we're using in a Myers cocktail, say, a large supply, uh, or larger than you could absorb all at once, say, uh, with your GI tract of, of, of magnesium, certainly magnesium. Uh, maybe the B vitamins, the blood titer goes higher, and therefore, just with some of the basics, okay, of of transport in the cell, you're going to have. If you use gradient, even you're, you're going to see more of those go into the cell than if you absorbed them by mouth. Certainly, more in the blood, right? That's a given. But more might go into the cell that way. With uh, well, in this case, with the testosterone being. Uh, spiked a higher titer at one point during the week with the once weekly dosing than the other way. Um, and that might be a benefit to us, just like, you know, when we're doing NAD or like I said, a Myers cocktail and the B vitamins and magnesium, that spike might have some benefit. We know it does something differently, you know, oral NAD, for example, versus IV NAD. Why wouldn't it uh, be different, you know, with the spike with testosterone? I don't know. I'm just riffing, mm -hmm. but at least I have something physiological, medically speaking, you know, that okay. they might, I'm glad, might I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad that this guy has this question because I've been hearing that lately and uh, I just wanted to ask you also personally, so I'm glad you said that. I know you said it to me before and you said, you know what, we'll just, why well, complicate just do it once a week, it's much easier, simpler, and, and but now if there's no benefit of doing it more than that, why would you, right? Well, but, but, but that said, if you have issues with your current dose, I asked somebody, why'd you do it? Well, I felt like I was on a roller coaster ride, Doc. I felt like day two and a half, three after my shot, when I know the titers are peaking, now that you told me, because, you know, hopefully I'm, I blew that because I didn't want the placebo effect to be even uh, considered. But before they knew, in other words, the pharmacokinetics of testosterone, they would tell me, you know, on the day three, I would feel a real charge of energy. And then by the time my next shot came around, I f could feel the difference. Well, that's a good reason because we're treating the patient here, right? Mm -hmm. And we're treating your symptoms. So sometimes it is a good idea. Someone divides the dose just in a biweekly is typically all that's needed. And oh yeah, I don't I don't have that rush of you know mm -hmm. almost mania, let's say, with the the high testosterone levels, and I don't have as much of a, a dive coming into my next shot. And it's and that that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, to use another example, people say, well, I know that I could probably use less anastrozole that way if they're going to use an AI or mm -hmm. if they're going to use a CERM, we'll talk about the CERM. But then, my, you know, okay, I just ask them, well, why, did, why do you care? You know, they're just agents to help us adjust those levels. If you take half a milligram instead of one milligram the day after your shot, is it that important? Mm -hmm. I, I don't see it medically, but again, I'm a registered libertarian. If they want to do it, great. But I, you know, it is a it is a um, an invasive procedure, an injection. So I know you go, well, come on, it's just an injection. Well, some people don't. Like sometimes it. it goes wrong. We all know that happens, right? You get a little infection or a, a mouse because of it. You know, it, it's that much more opportunity to disrupt the tissue and get a mouse if, that, if that's a, you know that's a good enough reason for for a lot of us including me anyway so so um back to his question which i think is or i guess he's asking me for comments right yeah what, what are your thoughts it. on this just, it oh, seems like a fairly light dose because again he says um, i also take 0 0.3 which is 60 milligrams for a total of 120 milligrams weekly again if it works great um if you're not satisfied consider using more because in my experience 120 milligrams weekly of a T sip or a, 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 well anything. I mean, if it was T probe, even worse. But you know, T sip or mm -hmm. T anthate, then uh, you might even feel better. Twelve hundred level doesn't tell me anything because again, guys, it depends upon when you did your last 
injection versus when you draw blood for those laboratory assays. Uh, it could peak on day two and a half and be, you know, 3,000, and then, you know, right before your next injection be down to, say, 800. So this doesn't really give me enough to go on, except, like I'm going to repeat, last time I promised, what's most important is he says he's feeling pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. then we don't, may not have to adjust anything. It, it, it might uh, be fine, but I'm just kind of giving you some parameters yeah. for the general population that I've noticed. I like it. Yeah. Thanks, Doc. Uh, question here says, how quickly does your testosterone drop when you stop? Three weeks or sooner? Good question. The testosterone form is important. If it's an ester of testosterone, each ester has a different half-life, we call it. Uh, the half-life sounds like a time period, but it's actually a rate of metabolism. And that confuses a lot of people. Uh, but uh, it's easy to put this way. If something has a, let's say, a three-day half-life, then that means that half of it is metabolized in three days. Then, in the next three days, half of what's left then is metabolized mm -hmm. and so on. So every three days, half of that is you know, typically metabolized. And then you get into things like terminal half-life, which depends on the substance, you know, and certain things. But generally speaking, you know, very, very generally, it might be like a five, five X of your half-life. Um, but I, you know, I'm getting way afield of, of, of this and not necessary to go through. But the concept is, you know, the, the, the rate at which it gets metabolized, that's very important to know what's left. And we have these different half-lives that range. I mean, in this country, you know, propionate, we'll say roughly three days, uh, an anthate, seven, cypionate, eight, and of course it all depends on what study you read. We have an undecanoate, which is so hard to get, it's not even worth talking about. Um, but three to four weeks, I think is a half-life. I'd have to double check. But um, um, so that definitely determines how soon your testosterone will drop in addition to how much you inject, right? Because if I inject two cc's of something with a half-life of eight days, I might get to here where, uh, you know, and, and out to here, rather than if it's one cc, I might get to here and only out to here. Mm -hmm. All these things come into play. So what I can answer, though, that might be of value is how quickly... Does your testosterone typically drop if you're using testosterone cypionate or an anthate, which is a typical TRT um, uh, uh, drug, and uh, with a typical dose of, let's call it one cc a week, well, a week is typically when, you know, that's why we're dosing it this way, so you don't drop below that therapeutic minimum, right? Uh, has nothing to do, well, no, I shouldn't say nothing, just because... Uh, you know, the seven-day half-life of an anthate happens to match a weekly dosing pattern. That's just coincidence. Okay, so let's not get lost in that. But um, what I have found is that when people get off of TRT, uh, cold turkey will probably just stop. The testosterone drops uh, way sooner than when they actually feel like the well wheels fall off the wagon. Mm. Some people will say after they haven't, you know, done their shot after, say, 10 days uh, from the last shot, they'll say, oh, I can feel it. And I believe them. But then somewhere around three weeks is when they go, oh, my God, that's when I really felt the exhaustion, the lack of libido, et cetera, et cetera. So just sort of a fun fact um, that I hope is helpful. Not so fun. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, so. the last one for today says uh, best subs to raise my 74 year old dad's testosterone and vitality without TRT question mark question mark. I all I have also put him on CJC 1295 Epimorlin 100 micrograms twice daily and 500 milligrams twice daily metformin to raise IGF one. And flip genetic longevity switches on while avoiding downregulating down -regulating insulin sensitivity. Huge thanks, guys. Agreed, Doc? Boy, I wish I could do better with this, but I, it's going to be hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so let's just start with it one by one. Uh, raising 
dad's TRT or testosterone without TRT? Um, well, we could probably get some rise. I'm just going to answer technically. Get some rise in testosterone without testosterone replacement, exogenous testosterone, using some of the old tricks for secondary hypogonadism, like I would prefer inclomiphene, not clomiphene. So one of the isomers of clomiphene citrate. Uh, so not including zooclomiphene. We talked about this before, I think, mm -hmm. right? right? So, uh, but the problem with that is it probably will not affect the second part of the question, the vitality. Because after somewhere around age 30, what I found in practice is treating secondary hypogonadism often isn't as successful, let's put it that way, as it could be, uh, if at all. And I can't tell you why. Because a lot of times we even see the levels go up. And yet it might only last for six months to two years. And with the same testosterone levels that we brought up from the depths, if you will, treating second, successfully treating secondary hypogonadism, the numbers are the same, but the treatment is no longer working. The patient says, I, I see the numbers, doc, but I'm telling you, I, I got all the symptoms again. So I can't explain that, sorry. I hope we get a, 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 a you know, I'll keep digging, but I, I can't explain that now. So at, for a 74 year old male, the likelihood that we're gonna see any benefits are probably none, but maybe, a smidgen of slim in there somewhere. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, so I'm sorry I can't give you any help there. Um, the the CJC epimoralin might be helpful to him. And the only way to check would be really to see what his IGF-1 is after using this for a while. Um, everyone's different in terms of how they're going to react to the, the stimulation and the potential to recruit us, the, 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 the pituitary gland. So it makes more growth hormone, but you know, the only way we could see is to try and, and see what happens and, 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 you know, test to see, and that might give him some sense of more vitality, but it's not going to, it's not going to raise his testosterone levels. Um, I, I'm not clear on the, the metformin here because first of all, I don't have a dose. Oh, no, I do. I'm sorry. 500 milligrams of metformin twice a day. Uh, I don't know how this is going to raise IGF-1, um, but it should improve insulin sensitivity. So the insulin levels, fasting insulin should drop, okay? Um, and that's a good thing. Um, in terms of flipping on genetic longevity switches, I'm not sure what that means in medical terms, but uh, I will say this, that, um, and maybe what he's getting at is that there's been uh, several studies that correlate lower IGF-1 with longevity, but the problem is we're correlating we don't have a mechanism, I mean, we have proposed mechanisms and all that stuff, and we have some other data that conflicts with this, mm. okay? So I wouldn't necessarily strive for low IGF-1. Um, I would, however, strive to use metformin because we have a lot of evidence, and we're about to hopefully complete a TAME study. Once it, I think it's fully funded now, so we're just waiting for it to start, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, near Niles Barzilay is heading that one up, and he's a very, very, very smart doctor and anti-aging specialist. Um, with metformin, there's all kinds of stuff we do. I won't get into the weeds with activating AMPK, et cetera. But we have found it helps um, with activating autophagy, which is, I think, what he's might, one of the things he might be referring to here in terms of you know, the longevity switches, um, uh, turning off mTOR, um, which would make a, a bodybuilder upset, actually. But uh, anyway, we're talking about longevity, and um, that one's a good one. We know that cancer loves sugar, so keeping blood sugar low. The only thing I would say here as it's, is, is at some point, all these things that we keep finding out about, we start making rules out of them, like this IGF-1 rule. One size does not fit all, and I would, I would exercise caution in applying this to anyone just blanketly. Because if you've got a very frail 74-year-old, okay, who's otherwise very, very healthy, you may actually want to raise IGF-1 and growth hormone. Because... 
you know, whatever it is, second, third, leading cause of death, you know, accidental deaths, and, you know, first or second on the list is, you know, a fall, you might want not want to be frail, in other words. And, you, again, so boosting your IGF-1 is good. Boosting your mTOR is good so you get more muscle growth and just, you know, maybe he's uh, uh, beat up and could use some of the, the regenerative potential of mTOR, and he's not so concerned right now about autophagy and these genetic longevity switches. And there's a lot of begging of the question that goes on here with some of these discoveries and applying it to, and this is the danger, you're applying it to that average person that doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the average person. Mm -hmm. It's a concept, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I just, to be careful, you want to, you know, maybe you do want to activate uh, growth hormone. Maybe you don't. Uh, and maybe you do it for a while. Maybe you don't. It might be a waste of time. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. If you're what we call hemoglobin A1C is 4.6, that's very relatively low. So your blood sugar on average is very low, okay? Maybe metformin is a complete waste of time. If blood sugar is the only mechanism and it's regulation therefrom with these different things I, I mentioned, like AMPK or not absorbing through the intestine as much, not creating as much from the liver, Maybe uh, you don't waste your time with metformin, you focus on something else. Maybe there's something particular about uh, the mechanisms of lowering sugar, though, that are great for you, whether it's using metformin or berberine or gynostema. These, these are questions we don't have answered yet. So, again, I'm just saying all this not to be Byzantine or to stir up a bunch of stuff and people go, what the heck is he talking about? Just be careful how you apply some of this stuff to, uh, you know, take into account each individual circumstances. Got it. And one last thing. For yes. example, just to drive it home, something that everyone will understand. I definitely don't want to increase growth hormone using CJC and epimorlin in someone who has extant cancer, even if it's something as simple as skin cancer. When I say simple, that's an organ that's got a cancer to it that can lead to death through yeah. melanoma. So yeah. uh, just making it simple. That, that's why you got to take it uh, you know, case by case. Yes. Yeah, good advice. Thanks, Doc.